I'd come to this project with many of the same assumptions that you have concerning the Jersey Devil murders and the guilt of Jim Seward. His characterization as a troubled young man responsible for a spree of horrific ritualistic homicides in the Pine Barrens. The question in my mind was why? Why would a man commit such crimes? After reviewing hours of archived footage generated by Stephen Avcast and Locus Wheeler, the hosts of Factor Fiction, I've been forced to change my perspective. The question now for me is what? What really happened that night? And is Jim Seward truly responsible? Ironically, in the course of this project, Jim Seward has died in prison under mysterious causes. His death will forever shroud the reconciliation of this case. As they said on Fact or Fiction, you decide. Nine one one. What is your emergency? My name is Jim Seward. I just hitchhiked here from uh, from the middle of the Pine Barrens, and I can't seem to get I can't I can't seem to find the people that I was in the Pine Barrens with, and I was camping with them last night doing a project. Are you lost? I'm not. I'm not lost. I'm just trying to. I can't find the people that that drove me here, and uh, you know I looked around for them, and I I went back to the to the site where we had parked, and they're not at the van, and they're nowhere to be found. Like. I don't know where they are. Their vehicle is still there? The vehicle's still there, and I had, to, I had to hitchhike to this payphone. How far are you from the vehicle right now? I'm about five, five, somewhere, you know, five, ten miles from it. I don't know. Okay, Jim, we'll send someone out. Yeah, I, I, it would be a good idea. I, I've got a really bad feeling about it. You might want to send somebody out quickly. I, I have a bad feeling. And... WBRK time, it is 5 o'clock. It's time for that afternoon drive that you love so much. Hey, guess who made the missing reports? It's those hosts from Factor Fiction. Missing. Ha. Bob, you know those guys are going to be showing up sometime the next day saying, Surprise, did you miss us? Let's go to the phones and uh, we'll ask you, do you miss them? We have found bodies. At this time, we don't know who they are or how many we have found. We cannot assume at this time that it is the Fact or Fiction crew. At this time, we have arrested Jim Seward for the murders of Ryan Clacken and Locus Wheeler. Behind me is a house where Jim Seward resided until his arrest nearly seven months ago. Inside, amongst his dirty laundry, blood evidence was found linking him to the grisly fact or fiction murders. Today, Jim's own life hangs in the balance as jurors decide his fate. I had heard of the fact or fiction murders. They were big news for a period of one year. And then, like so many things in today's fast-paced world, were forgotten. I was intrigued by how this case, this story was so well documented. How in spite of the remote location of the murders and the rural nature of the people prosecuting Jim, that these were murders of a high-tech age. I was intrigued by the fact that the four individuals were indeed children of a digital age. Mostly though, I wondered why the man named Jim Seward would commit such horrendous acts of violence. This is Johnny and Locus, and we are live in the Pine Barrens, where tonight we are doing a first ever 
internet, broadcast cable, ham radio, broadcast, all live, all real. And we are doing it with the help of a psychic and a sound man who has the ability to record sounds from other worlds, otherworldly sounds. Yeah, that's right, Stephen. We're here in the Pine Barrens, southern New Jersey, live and direct, coming right at you in your living room. First ever web simulcast, cable cast, and everybody is on the edge of their seat. And I know you are, because I am, and I'm sure Stephen is too. A little later, we're going to be showing you the campsite, but right now, we're going to do a little recapping, and you're going to see some tape of the history of the legend of the Pine Barrens and the Jersey Devil. They, they actually lived their show, fact or fiction. Here's this real eerie circumstances that come to play, and they actually were the victims of it. He had the opportunity. Um, it appears as if he had the motive. He did lure those people up there in a, in a veil of secrecy. I would say, yeah, he fits the profile. Who was Jim Seward? The answer proved more difficult than I imagined. His mother had died four months before the murders. His father, five years before. The only two people that I was able to speak with that knew him personally were his landlady, Joyce Dreyer, and a childhood psychologist named Dr. Dale Orstall. I'm sort of a father figure to him. I feel, sort of a surrogate father, if you will. Uh, he didn't talk a whole lot about his family life, but I, one of the things I know is that his father left uh, them when he was very young, ran off with another woman. Um, he had few friends, if any. Uh, wasn't, he was very reclusive. I remember him being quite a loner. He seemed to stay in his room quite a bit when he wasn't at work. And the computer seemed to be a highlight in his, um, in his life. With the advent of the Internet, uh, of course, he got into that years after I, I was seeing him. It wasn't even available, I don't think, at the time. It, it, it opened up a whole new world for a guy like Jim. Often he would uh, be on the internet with people, and as we know, the uh, horrible situation that has come up because of the internet fiasco with uh, him being blamed for these murders. The internet was the first of two interests that would attach him to the fact or fiction television show. The second interest was a bit more obscure. Jim had this fascination for magic. I mean, a true fascination. I mean, he, like I told you, he was very reclusive, so I, I believe he must have spent countless hours in his room alone working on tricks. And he used to come in and start the sessions, and he had to show me a new trick, and often was a simple card trick. But very quickly, he, he, he built skills and became very proficient at magic. The internet and magic. Both interests generally considered harmless. Both interests that could have a sinister edge to them. Either way, it was a combination that virtually sealed his fate in meeting Stephen Avcast and Locus Wheeler, the hosts of fact or fiction. Welcome to Fact or Fiction. Welcome to Factor Fiction. Yes, we are rolling. We are on. We are ready to go. Locus, you joker, you knew it all along that we were on, didn't you? Yeah, welcome to our new show. Well, actually, it's not a new show. It's got a new name. Thanks to everybody out there who helped us come up with this great name, Factor Fiction. That's right. Factor Fiction was one of those fluke successes that no television producer would ever predict. Short on production value, talent, and execution, it maintained a following of youth probably more amused by its kitsch value than anything else. Stephen Avcast, the creator of Factor Fiction, is remembered. Stephen, I always got bad, bad vibes about Stephen. Uh, you know, he always came in here with this, you know, attitude that, uh, you know, he always doing is making a little cable show, you know. I mean, there's 
Nobody ever goes anywhere with this stuff, but he had this idea. He was destined for stardom, and you know he was going to be rich, you know, millions of dollars, and you know he basically had that that big, you know, director like stereotype that you think of, uh, you know, you think of the big Hollywood directors, and I mean, he really just had to put it in perspective. Stephen's longtime friend, Locus Wheeler, was the co-host of the show. Their pairing was like oil and water. Locus, I think. Uh, he and Steven would have problems getting along sometimes, but I think I, I think Locust just really, I mean, he knew what he was doing, I mean, with this. He knew it was just a little cable show, and I think he was just in it for the fun. Somehow Steven, a misguided egomaniac, and Locust, a sardonic slacker, managed to keep turning out shows for the better part of 1995. The ideas were slim. However, they did latch onto one idea that intrigued many. We're also doing something new. We are on IRC tonight, and uh, we have joined IRC's the IRC is in the house. And, uh, yeah, you can say that. I'm saying it's swinging. Well, I'll have to say, one idea they come up with, it was actually, well, at first it was pretty cool, but it got to be pretty freaky, too. They came up with this idea. Now, most TV shows will have, like, call-ins where people call on the phone and talk. Well, they tied this into the Internet through IRC chat, except so people could, like, you know, ask questions on the show. But they rigged up some sort of text-to-speech converter, so like whatever they typed in was actually said on the show like it was a voice. It was this idea that provided the impetus for what would ironically give Stephen the fame he so craved. By the fall of 1995, the one-joke television show was losing popularity. By November, the show was about to self-destruct. Everybody had this sense. Once again, Stephen in his delinquency and procrastination has made it so we are too late to find the snow angel. At this desperate time, Stephen turned to viewer suggestions, one of which would take hold in his mind. It provided the seedling with which Stephen hoped to rebuild the show's popularity. You know, we, we had a call, we had an IRC come in, and it's a real eerie voice. I mean, it, it, it drove me nuts. I, I almost couldn't stand this after a while because he's just hearing this voice like, Hello, why don't you do a piece on? Why don't you do a show about the dirty metal? Stephen's idea was to do a first ever live broadcast of fact or fiction. It would be broadcast simultaneously to cable television and the internet. The promotions began immediately, and with ratings dropping at an ever-increasing speed, the concept was implemented immediately. This Jersey Devil cable cast, I mean, I, I for one, I knew it wasn't going to work. I mean, these guys couldn't even make a halfway decent TV show. I mean, now they, you know, suddenly they want to jump into doing, you know, big time live, you know, from the Pine Barrens and have radio and internet and this and that. And, uh, you know, I, I knew it was going to be a fiasco. I, I, well, I didn't really think it was going to end up like it did, but I knew it wasn't going to look pretty. Since the show was going to air from a remote location, Stephen hastily looked for people who might be able to help. A former employer of his, Sam Woods, was approached. This is uh, the room of Sam Woods. I used to cut his grass. He's a filmmaker, and he used to do soap operas, and... Um, we're going we're gonna to ask him if he wants to direct the show because I think he'd be, he'd be perfect and he's like, you know, a name and that, would, that could really be good for us. So I've had to talk to uh, Locus and try to convince him about it, but he's going for it. Well, here they come, so I'm going to have to turn it down. Steven. That's right. Steven. Yeah, um, and I'm, I'm sorry. Locus. Locus. Nice to meet you. Locus. Nice to meet you. Well, they say up to, up to 50,000 people could possibly be watching at any time, but they don't know exactly how many. But, but we're selling lots of t-shirts, so that's a good sign, I think. Uh, anyway, we have this idea, we want to take it in this like, direction where it's going to become you know, much bigger. And, and it would be really cool if you could you know, help us out, if you could direct the show. I know that you used to direct you know, lots of those soap operas. Network you know? soaps. Right. Yeah. right, right. This union of cable access show and former network soap director, never made sense to anyone. Though it was later discovered that Stephen was paying Sam out of his own pocket in an act of desperation to save fact or fiction. All right. You got it. You got it. You got it. We're in business. Yeah. yeah let's make some media here. This is cool. Thank you. 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 Thank
Sam Woods, a once successful television soap director, became one of the people I would question about these events. In stark contrast to his work, meeting him was another road sign on my travel into a surreal world. Well, this devil hunt thing never appealed to me. We're, we're, we're getting into a pretty flaky area there, you know. Uh, I think the kids were, they were asking for it with that one. Um, not, the, not, the kind of, not the kind of work I do, you know what I mean? Not what I do. For the internet end, Jay McDowell was enlisted. They, well, they came to me with a seedling idea. They said, you know, we want to we wanted use some of this technology we've been using for teleconferencing the video conferencing and we want to uh, you know we want to turn this into a broadcast thing they'd heard some talk about it and they'd seen some sites that were trying to do some stuff like that so they wanted something like that they wanted to do it uh, a live a live thing rather than like you know streaming canned video they wanted to actually broadcast and compress it all live so they basically just came to me with that seedling of an idea and I had to figure out uh, you know, all the, the technical aspects of how to make it happen, make it real, and what, uh, you know, kind of the packaging for it, what it was really going to be in the final product. Stephen and Locust decided that they needed additional help at the actual location. They searched vaguely for a sound man and a guide, and on December 7th, 1995, worlds collided. Okay, we're here at Ryan's and we've come today to meet him uh, in hopes that uh, he'll be able to help us out on our trip to the Pine Barrens. Basically, Ryan is uh, an audio whiz and uh, supposedly he's been able to document, uh, supposedly he's been able to document, uh, you know, paranormal uh, occurrences on tape. So that's what we're going to see today. We're also going to be meeting Jim, who does some uh, psychic things. And uh, we'll see, you know, hopefully these guys will fit the bill and we'll be able to go down to the Pine Barrens with them, you know. Could use the, the extra help. Is that good? Yeah? yeah Got enough? Good. I hope so, this damn mic works. You ready? Yeah, so okay. Let's... Remember, play it cool. Play it cool. Is this going to blow us, this airplane sound? Come on. Uh, Steven, uh, this is Ryan, right? Ryan? Yep. I'm, How you doing? I'm uh, Locus. 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 Here, I'll just turn it off. So you just taped us? Yeah, I guess so, actually. So, so do you have like a surveillance set up here or something? Well, or what? for the time you know, I kind of did. I just set it up outside. I have like plugins I can plug into the wall and stuff if I need to. At one point, this was like a working studio of some sort. So I, uh, I, th I think maybe uh, Jim has arrived now. Can you? Hold on. Hey, hey, uh, Jim. What's up? How are you? Doing pretty good. Lotus. Uh, Locus. 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 Hi. How are you? I'm Jim. It was inevitable that the combination of the internet, a television show about paranormal happenings, and similar ages would draw Jim Seward to fact or fiction. So, uh, just to, uh, to give, some little, give a little background, you know, basically we're going to be doing this uh, webcast, uh, cable cast, in, in, uh, in search of the, the Jersey Devil, the Leeds Devil, uh, down in the Pine Barrens. And basically why we've gotten you guys together here is because you have uh, skills uh, uh, regarding audio and paranormal activity, so we're hoping that you can help us in that way. And you have uh, these psychic abilities. Psychic abilities that I can, you know, I, I feel I feel that I can I can really help out. I understand what you're trying to do, and I really think that I can help out. You can help us find help us find a location. You can help us tap into whatever we need. I can pinpoint that location. Uh, Jim came to me one day and told me how excited he was that he had met these people over the internet. It was uh, some show, fact, or, or fiction, and he was to be their guide in the Pine Barrens. And what really amazed me, I, I just didn't think um, he knew or had any knowledge of the Pine Barrens to be able to even be a guide. But um, he seemed so excited about it. Is this, is this good? Yeah. Do you want to hold them up or do you want me to just call them? I just, 
just like this. You don't have to touch him. You can't touch him. Okay. Six spade. Seven spade. Four spade. Five spade. Eight club. Eight diamond. I saw him probably about two or three weeks before the, the incident. I ran into him at a shopping mall and he, he was very excited about his life. He, um, he said he was studying acting. His magic was coming together. Uh, people were appreciating it. Combined with the acting, I, I guess he did a few gigs on a small level, but it was, it was going very, very well. Give him more acid. There's something on his arm. Something on his arm. Uh, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. Jesus. 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 One, three, nine, five. What is that? What does this mean? What does this mean, Jack? Do you know what this means? No. Yeah, you got Back off, back off. You recording this? Yeah. Was Jim psychic? It was not likely. The card demonstration and the supposed psychic fit in which numbers appeared on his arm were nothing more than simple tricks known to any amateur magician. To Stephen and Locus, Ryan Clacken and Jim Seward were perfect for factor fiction. Youthful, eager, and strange. On December 15, 1995, Stephen Avcast Locus Wheeler, Ryan Clacken, and Jim Seward headed for the Pine Barrens of New Jersey to do a live broadcast in search of the Jersey Devil. Jim Seward would be the only one to return. 911, what is your emergency? My name is Jim Seward. I just hitchhiked here from, uh, from the middle of the Pine Barrens and I can't seem to Get, I, can't, I can't seem to find the people that I was in the Pine Barrens with and I was camping with them last night doing a project. Are you lost? I'm not, I'm not lost. I'm just trying to, I can't find the people that, that drove me here. And, uh, you know, I looked around for them and I, I went back to the, to the site where we had parked and they're not at the van and they're nowhere to be found. Like, I don't know where they are. Their vehicle is still there? The vehicle's still there and I had, I had to hitchhike to this payphone. How far are you from the vehicle right now? I'm about five, five, somewhere, you know, five, ten miles from it. I don't know. Okay, Jim, we'll send someone out. After Mr. Seward uh, made the call, uh, we went to the area that he specified and did a preliminary uh, look around uh, under um, a, a missing persons investigation. I mean, I just figured that was one of their little stints to do, just to try to get that extra, you know, that extra sensationalism. So, I mean, I, I didn't think anything of it at first. You know, I, I kind of expected them to try something like that. We have a 187. Repeat, we have a 187. This isn't a missing person's report anymore. Nine drop. We're clear. Do you need emergency support? Ten drop. No, this guy is definitely DOA. One body we found approximately 2.5 miles from the campsite. Uh, the other body we found approximately three miles from, from the campsite. The body of Stephen Avcast was never found. Large amounts of blood in the snow and a hat were all that remained of this third victim. In any murder investigation, anybody associated with the victims is a suspect. Our job is to eliminate suspects based on the evidence that we sift through and that we gather, and as we sifted through and gathered this evidence, there was only one suspect left at the end, and that was Mr. Jim Seward. Who led everybody to the site? I did. 
you did. Did anybody else know where you were going to set up in camp? Well, I was asked to, uh, to find a place for us to, to camp, and I, I thought that I was doing a good job at it, and Ryan continued to provoke me and, uh, and then giving me a hard time about my ability to locate the place that we would camp. And uh, ultimately, it just it led to an argument, and I, I, I ran away from the group. Did you hit him first? I, 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 I don't know. I think I, I might have pushed him. Sometimes I can't remember if I, you know, I, I just I did what I, I, I ran away from the, the group, and I found a spot that I thought would be good to locate the Jersey Devil. After we got the permission from the state of Pennsylvania uh, to search Mr. Seward's residence. Uh, we went to his residence and uh, we did conduct a search for anything that we felt would um, help us in this case. And we did find the garments that Mr. Seward was wearing that night with the blood of the three victims on it. Interestingly, the garments that Mr. Seward was wearing were merely lying right on his bedroom floor, uh, along with the other dirty laundry that was there. Even as Jim was arrested, the evidence continued to mount against him. We could tell that the nature of the blows with the weapons that were used were consistent with the size and build of the accused. In this case, it was very clear that the attacker was using both hands with two weapons and was ambidextrous. And the suspect in this case is ambidextrous, which is quite rare. He was the only survivor in a place where nobody else was. You know, it, it doesn't look that good for him. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we will show that on December 15, 1995, Jim Seward maliciously and with premeditation killed Ryan Clacken and Locus Wheeler. We will show without doubt how he planned this well in advance of that day. We will show with video shot by the deceased that Jim Seward was and is a devious and cunning person using the guise of psychic to perpetrate these horrible acts. The proceedings that summer turned out to be one of the greatest spectacles of Baroque County history. The trial attracted a strange assemblage of cult followers, ritual homicide fanatics, and others seeking to satisfy their morbid curiosities. Eventually, it became a matter of trying to keep the tabloid press at bay, an effort which was not entirely successful. When the court case came up, it was, I mean, it, the media frenzy was, you know, hysterical. I mean, I couldn't, I felt like they were, you know, everybody, somebody was watching me like every minute when they were like just talking to everybody. Everybody had the slightest thing to do with the show. I mean, who knows, they probably even like talked to every single viewer that said they watched the show. But uh, I mean, just reporters day in and day out and police here just taking everything they could. Anything, it was every videotape, every prop and I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, I don't know what they were looking for. All they were getting was a bunch of bad television. In an election year, what the prosecution was looking for was an open and shut case. And in the state of New Jersey versus Jim Seward, they found it. Not content to leave any stone unturned, they decided to utilize the very video that Stephen Avcast and Locus Wheeler had shot. The man, who would later by the press, come to be known as the Killer Cutter, was hired to go through this video and put together an incriminating image of Jim Seward. The prosecution contacted me in uh, early uh, January 1996. They, um, they had a pretty good case against him, it seemed to me, from what I saw. Uh, you know, they had uh, blood evidence, they'd found the blood, and you know, this was the only guy there. Uh, uh, and, and he knew where, he was the only one that knew where it was and uh, but they really wanted to clinch this case I mean they didn't want they, they really wanted to get him I mean they didn't want any there to be any question that he had done it um, so they came they came to me with all this videotape like 15 hours of videotape and uh, this was video that these guys who did this cable show had shot you know, on location. I'd never really edited anything like, I mean, I'd never seen anything like this before. I mean, this was like video from the crime scene. And normally, you know, I, I've got, you know, hours and hours of people, you know, talking heads, like, you know, you know, in some room somewhere, like, you know, badly shot. This was badly shot, but at least it was out in the woods, you know. It was 
It was different. The prosecution's video was intended to show facts, perhaps not inadvertently. It also created an intimacy with the murdered three that the defense was unhappy with. They protested it, deeming it an unfair swaying towards a guilty verdict. This was not enough reason for the video to be struck down, and so it was used. The first point demonstrated that Jim was indeed leading the group into very remote regions of the Pine Barrens, areas where there was no hope for help or aid from the civilized world. The following represents excerpts from the first section of the prosecution video. Over 54 minutes of video showing the four wandering deeper into the pines was shot. It is estimated that the four walked for more than two hours before Jim finally decided upon the location of their operations. Hey guys, he's starting to go. Let's get this stuff together. So what's the deal, Jim? Something's coming right through here. When Jim finally found the perfect location, it was more than three miles from their van and the nearest access road. The second point was to make evident a defendant who had an agenda an agenda warped enough to commit these murders. I've been been contacting the uh, supernatural world for the last week and uh, last couple days. And, and I've been in contact getting my spiritual self together for this journey that we've, we've put, put ourselves out on. And um, we are headed in the right direction. I can assure you, I can feel it. It's a, it's a gut instinct in my body that we're going to find the Leeds Devil. And we're going to settle this case once and for all. I feel that what I'm doing here and for you is perfectly authentic and it's, you know, I have a feeling inside, it's, it's a definite feeling that we're at a place where, where the Jersey Devil, we will encounter the Jersey Devil. I know we're headed in the right direction. Repeated phrases I, such as, we're going to settle this thing once and for all, and I know we're headed in the right direction, seem to clearly show Jim's agenda. It didn't take much to read into these phrases and see an individual with a plan that was to be carried out in the desolate Pine Barrens. As the prosecution's video progressed, Jim's personality changed from a quiet and shy person to one that presented the prosecution with an opportunity to show the violent nature just below the surface. Look, man. <coughs> I'll see you back at camp, man. I don't know. I don't know what Jim's doing. I think he's talking about Burns. An agenda proven and a potential violent streak proven, the prosecution solidified their first-degree murder case against Seward with video taken in the barn, video in which the original date of the trip appeared on Seward's arm. The defense attempted to have this also struck from the records claiming the video of Seward to be that of a character he was playing. The prosecution countered by agreeing fully with this assessment of Seward and the events in the barn, events that had taken place a full two weeks before the trip, the best argument for premeditated murder. The trip began at sunrise. Stephen ran a video camera much of the time, documenting what should have been amusing but banal preparation. Okay. You wanna... oh. okay, Locust, yo, you want to do like a burp about us? Uh... Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Mobius! He's right over here. 
right? Yeah, but I'm getting like ba the backlights kill your face. I think. What do you mean the backlights kill my face? Why don't you adjust it? What do you mean you can't? Okay. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Go. Okay. Here we're at Ryan's barn. We're getting. Okay. No. Here. Come here. Come on. I'm trying to get at this on camera. The trip, guided by Jim, took them into the loneliest of areas on a lonely cold day. Here's to you, Stephen. Thank you. A stop at a gas station was the last obvious landmark before they moved into the unidentifiable roads of the Pine Barrens. Our candy. Our candy. At a certain point, at Jim's request, they stopped, parked, and started walking into the woods, following the psychic visions of Seward. Now, it's... I'm just saying, if he's going to do it, this is part of the show, we got to do it in the place he thinks is right. Because if we're going to find something, you know, yeah, we could fake it, but I don't go for that. I think we should go for real, and he's off doing his thing. That's why we got him here. I'm just... I'm just getting cold. Well, we knew this was going to be it. We knew, we all talked about it. We knew we were going to be way out there. Here he comes. Let's see what he says. Be quiet, guys. Get this guy from anywhere. Psychics are us. <laughs> I think this is a pretty good idea, us waiting around and then him finding the spot, you know, and then taking the stuff over to it, you know? Yeah. We still gotta go back to the car and get stuff, man. See, I don't think he knows that. Was he volunteering? Did he know? I don't think so. Yeah, well, I know he's not carrying too much, but you know what he said about that. It's a vibe thing. Tensions increase as they work further into the Forsaken Pines. And then, a key point in the prosecution video arrives. Okay. Jim, are you a psychic or a psycho? Look, man. Okay. I'll see you back at camp, man. Approximately one hour later, judging from the sun, a camp is being built. Discussions are already being had about Seward. Seward is not helping. He is keeping to himself. For the next two hours, the video of the group is a collection of promotions for future cable shows. The camera frequently left on between takes. This is Locus reporting from the Pine Barrens, and I'm with Ryan, our sound man. Gee, Ryan, I'm pretty parched. I sure am too. Wow, is that... Is that mulberry natural spring water? Yes, from Mueller's. Wow. How about, I wish I could have a sparkling glass of that. Boy, I'm telling you, and in a gallon jar. Jug. The mood is good. Let's do that again. Jim does not join them. Instead, staying in the tent on IRC. I don't really feel like I'm being uh, taken very seriously, you know, um, by really any of you. Well, I'm, I'm taking you seriously. We, we set up here, you know. We... I mean, I'm doing what what I do, and uh, I don't appreciate being laughed at. Well, it's, it's just a stress thing, you know. Um, look, we're gonna be going on in a bit. Do you you gonna come out for the broadcast or what? I think that I'll probably stay in here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well... Stay on IRC. Okay. At 10 p.m., in what will be the last broadcast, Fact or Fiction goes live. This is Johnny. And Locus. And we are live in the Pine Barrens, where tonight we are doing a first-ever internet broadcast cable... Jim has been on IRC for two hours and 30 minutes. A surveillance camera records the camp to VHS tape. It runs for two hours before shutting off. At 1 a.m., the last tape in the series of 22 tapes, shot by Locus Wheeler and Ryan Clacken, reaches its end. Maybe this is a way for him hey, to like, try to scare us or something. Man, this thing's still on. What the hell's going on here? Oh, I must have left it on. We should change tapes. Did you change tapes? Here, I'm going to change tapes in this. 
There is no indication that this is done. No other footage exists. The tapes show a group of men going through a wide range of emotions, seemingly enjoying their jaunt into the Pine Barrens. The tape shows the brooding nature of one man who does not share in the frivolity. The tapes do make clear the maladjusted nature of Jim Seward. Though Seward maintained his innocence, the facts were indisputable. Four people went into the Pine Barrens. Only Jim returned. Blood of all three was found on Jim's shirt. His pushing rind showed a potential violent streak. The angle and depth of the cuts and lacerations matched somebody of his height and weight, and more importantly, ambidextrous nature. The number, which closely matched the date of the murders appearing through ashes on his arm, was deemed to be a good case for premeditated murder. The tape showing the four walking further and further into the woods virtually guaranteed a seclusion from civilization that would make the killing easier. The defense's one victory was getting the third charge of murder, the murder of Stephen Avcast, dropped. Though a body is not necessarily needed to prove a murder, the prosecution had more than enough evidence with the two bodies that were found. On July 16th, 1996, Jim Seward was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to two life terms to be served consecutively. Went out last night for a take a little ride and met a little CD and a shot of down back home. Crawled in the bed with the 44 pistol under my head. I think the whole trial, I think, it was a kangaroo court of sorts. Uh, a pig circus. I mean, it's the police obviously didn't do their homework. They're they're not investigating to the best of their ability because there has to be uh, there there has to be some evidence indicating somebody else or something else. Woke up next morning about a half past nine with the horse and the buggy standing in line. The case they built up against him, it was all circumstantial. They didn't have any actual evidence that he did this, but uh, I mean, he was the only one there. They really had no one else to go on. I don't consider having the blood of, of victims all over your clothes as circumstantial. I mean, that's pretty hard evidence as far as I'm concerned. You don't get blood on your clothes from, from, uh, uh, from a murder victim, you know, just out of the air. I mean, you have to be there conducting those murders to get that blood on your clothes. I don't, I don't consider that circumstantial in the least. No, I can't explain that. I can't, I can't explain why there will be blood on my shirt. Would you agree that it looks bad? Excuse me? Would you agree that things don't look very good for you right now? I, I, don't, I don't... The way that you're telling me, it doesn't look that good for me, but I can't understand where this evidence came from. The evidence of blood on Jim's shirt was a strong point for the prosecution. DNA tests showed indisputably that it was the blood of the three that had gone into the woods with Seward. As I look at the images of DNA patterns and pools of blood, I wonder though if perhaps the jury, anxious not to ignore DNA evidence as had happened in other trials, perhaps looked too closely. Through the magnifying glass of the prosecution's microscope, the evidence was solid. However, a macroscopic view begged another question. Could the master of this orgy of violence have walked away from his work with merely the equivalent of 17 eye drops of blood on his shirt and nothing else? You know, every piece of evidence they would get, you know, they'd, uh, you know, try to tie it somehow instead of thinking, you know, okay, well, gee, you know, does this have anything to do with something else? They would always take a piece of evidence and go, well, gee, how could Jim have done that, have used this, you know? And it's kind of like, after a while, it's like building up like a, you know, a, a house of cards, you know? And after a while, they just kept building up, building up, and, and eventually they, they had enough built up to, uh, you know, get a case against them. 
I wasn't really monitoring their, their, their conduct outside the camp, you know. I was doing my thing. What were you doing? I was on IRC. In the tent? Yeah. All night? All night. About what time did you start on IRC? Probably around uh, 8.30. When we, we interviewed some of the individuals that Mr. Seward claimed to have been talking with on IRC that evening, and um, they have all, and we've looked at their logs as well too, their, their, uh, their chat logs from their, from their computers, and uh, we have determined that there was about a 45 minute gap between um, when Mr. Seward made one comment to when he made the next comment. And 45 minutes is a, an awfully long time to not be responding to other people um, on the internet. I mean, they say this, the, the signal, uh, signal dropped out, so, you know, it, you know, Jim could have walked away. And I guess that, that, you know, that is possible. It is possible, yes. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a world-class sprint runner to cover that, that amount of ground in 45 minutes. doubts of this one guy doing all that to these bodies. The, the murdered pair, they, they were they're darlings of the media. I mean, it was one of the reasons they jumped on this whole thing so quickly and had to come up with a conclusion of what happened was just that. It was their, their very own. As, as professionals uh, in law enforcement, uh, we do not feel the pressure from outside sources, be it the media or otherwise, uh, to conduct our investigations. We conduct them to the, to the best of our ability at all times. Uh, there were no other suspects to apprehend or to interview or to consider. The, all the evidence pointed that Mr. Seward was the only suspect. And therefore, all we had to do was gather the evidence to prove Mr. Seward's guilt. We did not have to gather evidence to gather other suspects. On January 2nd, 1997, an event occurred that forced me to rethink the making of this documentary. The very thesis with which I had begun this journey. Jim Seward was found dead in his jail cell of undetermined causes. On January 3rd, a package arrived at my door, which I think in no way was coincidental with the death of Jim Seward. The acquiring of mysterious videotape has changed the mood behind the making of this documentary. Gone is the attempt at pure objectivity with which we started. Now we question, who gave us this tape? And more importantly, what, if any information does it hold that was never brought up in the trial? Going to the authorities with this new tape is pondered, but rejected. To them the case is closed, and with Jim's death, appeals are a moot point. Nothing is ruled out. The tape could be a hoax. I am conscious of one thing, though. My search for the truth behind the fact or fiction murders has in some way become part of the story. And there was this discussion on the last tape that, you know, that they were going to change tapes. But, you know, whether that ever happened or not, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't see any other tapes. And, uh, you know, the, from what I saw, the camera, it was, it was pretty damaged. So if there was any tape in there, I'd... I don't know. I, I mean, I doubt that it ever could be, you know, played. My name is Michelle Monarch, 
I'm a magnetic media data recovery specialist. The uh, particular videotape that I was given was Mango, almost beyond recognition. I um, digitized sections of this particular video, placed it into the computer, and am now reconstructing the actual picture frame by frame. And I have to guide the computer to complete these pictures. There were some that were easily captured by the computer, others were unrecognizable, and I'm rebuilding them now at this time. As the tape is reassembled by Shelley, it becomes apparent that some sections are rather viewable. And I'll say, like, you know, yeah, I'm hunt you know, I'm here while Locus is out hunting for the Jersey Devil. And I'll be like, ah, shut up. Or, yeah, you can be like, <laughs> I don't see him. <laughs> no, no, we better not do that because, you know, we've got to deliver on this show. This is the big one here. <laughs> okay, are we ready there, uh, Ron? Now, right now. Uh, do you want me to still be rolling on this stuff, uh, huh? Steven? Do you want to state that that whole thing? I think I kind of could hear you. I've been rolling the camera, just messing around, shooting camp stuff. But could you, uh, what was the deal with... I don't care if you hear <sighs> this or not on the camera. I mean, this is never going to make it anything but the cutting room floor, as they would say in the film days. From what Sam was saying. Sam, boy, even he was more... All right, there, there you go. I don't, I don't want to be like a bitch all night, you know? That's good, this works. All right, all right, though. I'm going to take a walk out into the woods here and just sort of scout out the uh, location. I also got to kind of go to the bathroom. But, um, uh, but you know, do some stuff. Yeah, I'll get do on the sound. Get on the trumpet, do the sound. Because, I mean, you only have that one. We're thing. experiencing Newark, so like doing this thing here. So yeah, yeah, I know, but yeah, the airplanes from Newark are all awesome. But we got a little bit, I mean, we got that one machine going. But I want to hear, I want to see that little reel going. Okay. I want to see you on that trumpet. I want to see you working for, you know, the reason that you're out here. And Locus, come on, man. IR-144 double X awaits you. Do some work, man. Sure, Steven. Anything you say, big guy. Yeah. Coming right at you. All right, I'm going to... Let me get going here. I'll be back in about three minutes. Okay, man. Okay. I'll be on that before we get back. You do me a favor. Flick on the machine, will you? <laughs> there goes a little tyrant. <laughs> Here, come on, I, I got the camera rolling. Do a little Steven imitation for me. Oh, Steven being such a... What's the What are you trying to say? Oh, no, I'm talking about Steven being a pussy. I'm not talking about Jim being a pussy. <laughs> Jim, Jim's a Jim's one psycho motherfucker. You want to get, let me get that on. Let me get that on camera. Of course it's running. We're supposed to record everything. Here, give, give me, give me a, give me a Jim. <laughs> Why don't you do that line that you said when you were out of the bush? What did you, what did you think when Jim pushed you? freaked me out, man. I didn't really expect him to be violent. I thought he was like, see, that's what I don't get, man. He's like totally like, I, I thought he was like a, like a, one of those guys, like, you know, those peace fucking meditation dudes or something, man. I didn't think they did that. Following these recorded moments, a large portion of the tape is smashed. It is a section that Shelley will attempt to restore. The next section that is immediately viewable happens somewhere in the middle of the tape. The first thing that is apparent is that this is tape shot by Locus and Ryan. Stephen is nowhere to be seen. They are searching for him. On her third day of restoration, Shelley makes another discovery. The anonymous tape is not from one, but two cameras. Both Ryan and Locus took cameras into the forest. Back to Wait, hold on a sec. Let me get the light up here. 
And this is fact or fiction. We can't find Steven. Here we are in the Pine Barrens on a trip that he drug us out here for. We did a webcast, simulcast, cast, cast, cable cast that really was pretty poor if you ask me. But that doesn't matter at this point because Steven, our main host, is missing. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Love is gone. He's gone and we can't find him. All I want to do is drink some beer. <laughs> this is the a camp. show. See, this is for you, Steven. Even though we don't know where you are, we just want you to know that we're being really loyal to this whole shoot everything. <laughs> oh man, come on now. Where's In the sixth day of her work, Shelley puts together a stunning piece of tape. It is a moment in time that proves so much. Print. I think it goes off this way. Do you see anything over there? For a while. Do you know what time it is? Oh man. Mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's late. It's like uh two forty five. Two forty five. Yeah. Ryan and Locus were alive and speaking the time to one another when they were supposed to be being killed. And they're alive, and they're saying the time on the video. To me, that proves that Jim absolutely was not killing him at that time. Jim's an innocent man, and this was not investigated in any way, shape, or form. It was, it was overlooked. So many details were overlooked. Also, if he's an innocent man, there's a killer on the loose. Shelley's work slowly gives voices to the dead. Ghosts caught on video. The processing of the tape is quickly becoming more difficult for Shelley. Now only bits and pieces tell the story of what happened in the woods. On February 5th, Shelley presents a section of videotape that is nothing short of horrifying. It intensifies the question of who the killer is. On February 7th, Shelley finds what she thinks is the same moment in time from Locus's camera. It cannot, however, be viewed. She remains hopeful as she begins the process of trying to reconstruct a lost video. The computer needs me to direct it. It doesn't know how to reconstruct a circle. Maybe it'll have an opening at the side, and I have to teach it to continue the circle. Yeah, I, I'm a guiding factor. While Shelley begins the process of attempting to restore video, I will attempt to find a truth within the film I have already shot. You know, in sitting there waiting for these video edits to render, I, I did wonder about certain aspects of the case, like, you know, um, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, I wonder, am I doing the right thing? Is this, you know, did this guy do it? I mean, I, it seemed to me from what all what I saw that, you know, 
it was pretty likely that he did it. I mean, he had the blood evidence and stuff like that. But then there was that the one guy that uh, and they never found his body. Now, you know, what happened to him? I mean, could he have done it? I don't know. It is an obvious question, a question I had presented to all the people interviewed. The tape restoration is showing Locus and Ryan searching for Stephen, which only makes the question more relevant. What happened to Stephen Avcast? By process of elimination, I proceed. We did find some blood, and of course the uh, infamous Johnny hat that was found. Um, we were never able to find any more remains of that person, so we don't know if he's dead or alive. They, they never found Stephen's body, but they found Johnny. But they found his hat, you know, so, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird that the only thing left of him is a hat. Yeah. Coming right at you. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call here. I'll be back in about three minutes. Okay, man. Okay. I'll be on that before we get back. We don't think that uh, Mr. Afghast would uh, uh, would be able to uh, set up Mr. Seward uh, because the amount of blood that we found of Mr. Afghast is, is so great that he would have bled to death trying to set Mr. Seward up. There goes a little tyrant. <laughs> oh, whoa, man, check it out, man. What, what? Here, find that over there. Oh, wow, what's that? I don't know, man. There you go. Looks like a light. Yo, it's Steven's light. What? It's Steven's light. Yo, Steve! Steven! In finding that Jim's alibi holds up, we have to attempt to answer the question raised. Who killed these people? The likely suspect would appear to be Stephen. As I watch these frames, though, I see no recognition in Locus's face. I see Locus, a man larger than Stephen, turn tail and run, as does Ryan. Stephen Avcast, being the culprit of the horrendous massacre that took place in the minutes that followed this tape, is impossible to believe. Along with the amount of blood that belongs to Stephen Avcast, this makes me believe that he also was murdered in the Pine Barrens. I am now also of the belief that the killer was somehow something more horrendous than possible to imagine. What could have killed three healthy men? What would have left no footprints? What would have torn the men into 47 pieces, leaving no evidence of a struggle? We could tell by the, what was the left of the infliction of the wound that it was a serrated type weapon. That much we know. There were no knife fragments or any evidence of the actual weapon used other than the cuts themselves. We're, we're a rural county. We have people who are not greatly educated. Folk, uh, rumors and folklore are common. I put no credence in anything of that nature. I just go by the facts that the police were able to ascertain. A monster? Yeah, I think this person's a monster. I don't believe fact or fiction. I don't believe the fiction. I think that this is a person, and I'm going to find out who it is. I'm going to reconstruct and do my job to recover what has been lost, the facts. It is as though the Jersey Devil is a monster reborn in a digital age, reborn on the internet, a demon captured on IRC logs, mangled video, whispers in the dark. It is to these that I look. It's totally anonymous. I mean, you can't trace a call. You don't know if it's man, woman, old, young. You don't know anything. You don't know where it's from. I mean, so, I mean, in one way, I don't know why the cops didn't try to do anything, you know, and try to figure out, well, who made that idea? Who came up with that suggestion? Why don't you do a show about the Jersey Devil? We have this show, Fact or Fiction, it's a paranormal variety show. You know, we have guests come on, that kind of thing. Well, there, you know, things have kind of been a little slow over at the station, so we thought what we would do is we'd, uh, 
we'd make a little excursion. Uh, there was a suggestion uh, via IRC. There was a suggestion uh, via IRC uh, to um, to uh, well, and also from to the mailbag. Yeah, that guy D something, whatever his name. Is. Well, you know, one thing about IRC that's really hard is that you know it really is hard to trace it because I mean it's not like like you know like the phone number they're calling from. I mean this could have happened, could have been like uh, Shanghai where they were writing this message from. I mean you just don't know. That's part of the beauty and part of the evil of it. It is amazing to be so near, yet so far from the possibility of knowing who the killer is. D something. Over at the station, so we thought what we would do is we'd, uh, we'd make a little excursion. Uh, there was a suggestion uh, via IRC uh, to... Um, to uh, well, and also from to the mailbag. Yeah. That guy D something, whatever his name was. I mean, it's just not practical to keep logs of that stuff. I mean, I get so much email, so much... It would just clog up my system. I, I, I erased it as we went along. I mean, once a job, once a point got finished, I killed the email, got rid of it. It was it was like a to-do list. I check it off, I get rid of this stuff. So once things weren't pertinent anymore, I just got rid of them. So I don't have anything of it really. I mean, there there were like a couple of emails that we had uh, at, at the very end there, but there's nothing illuminating there. It gets harder and harder to stick with your original gut feeling. I mean, because of the media, uh, you know, and, the, and the, the attention that the whole case is getting and how one-sided, uh, lopsided the whole thing is, and you start to think, maybe, Maybe he did do it. Maybe there's a side of Jim that I don't know that, that was capable of such an atrocity. As this journey nears its end, I begin to fully understand the essence of what this is about. The media upon which these events were recorded, the media that should have been able to provide a truth more pure than ever before, has somehow become the story. This has become more than a search for the truth behind the fact or fiction murders. It has become an indictment of truth and how it is viewed through the lens of the media. A uh, pretty exciting moment here because the fact or fiction logo is on screen, uh, which means one thing, that we are now uh, actually getting our feed live to the um, cable company, the access. Reality television, the news. The 60-second clip of truth have made even the strongest of doubters wonder. Are you a psychic or a psycho? Look, man. <laughs> I'll see you back at camp, man. Wait. Man, why do you gotta be so... What did you say to me? What did you say to uh, me? man. Didn't you, he said... Well, Wait, you what do you mean he's gonna be where we did the camp? Psycho. Where the hell's the camp? This is the whole fucking thing. Where the hell is the camp? We can't lose it. Well, we're losing Well, go find guy. him, man. Ryan. I'm not gonna go anywhere near him. What a fucking asshole, man. Just cut the damn camera already. I mean, what is the truth? The editing process is it's like man. sifting that stuff out. That ultimately, I mean, not necessarily with these legal videos, but uh, uh, with a documentary film, I mean, ultimately it's what the filmmaker perceives as the truth. I mean, don't you think that's what you're trying to do, right? The mistakes that were discovered on this journey were stunning. Shoddy police work and a judgmental video presented the world with a person guilty before ever being tried. I know Jim is not guilty. I know that the truth is still at large, potentially closer than anyone can realize. 
It is as though the real killer planned a media event so amazingly cunning that it could be thought of as scripted, a kill ready for prime time, so to speak. Perhaps the demon we call the Jersey Devil did kill them in the Pine Barrens, but if so, the Jersey Devil is the electronic image, the sound, the communication to the masses, somehow twisted into a surrealist electronic world. I always asked the question last, do you think Jim did it? And with the exception of authorities directly accountable to the answer, I have felt that the answer given has been, it doesn't matter. The truth is what time has made of this event. It has been good for business. Often murder is. So many involved have benefited from this event. The inevitable book deal is being replaced with a career in the business of image control, and most of the people interviewed are ready to embrace it. I guess a grim irony here, as these uh, post-its can attest, uh, the fact that when we have some real dead bodies, then uh, the sharks start circling. Uh, strange that uh, an incident like that would uh, be a prelude to a, to a new phase in my career. Well, it's interesting. As after the court case was over with all the publicity and everything surrounding it, uh, you know, I started getting uh, phone calls for a couple job leads. I mean, uh, you know, so in one way, it, this might have helped me out of here. How long will it take to process the entire tape? It's not my intention to process the whole tape. I don't need to do that. It could take hours. It could take days. I need to process a particular piece of this tape that could potentially reveal a killer. Shelley continues to extrapolate information from a frame, while I will reenact the events of December 15th, 1995. This is one of the stops that the guys have made on the way to the Pine Barrens. I know this because of the extensive documentary footage that they've taken of this place. I don't know what good this will do. I think it's just to keep myself clear on what happened. You know, the order of events. Strangely, the weather is almost identical to the way it was that day. I'm now traveling an access route that I know Stephen and Locus had taken for the Jersey Devil Project. Uh, we're in the midst of the Pine Barrens at this point. And what I'm hoping to do is, is see if I can't do a recreation of the campsite, perhaps the murder scene. Hopefully traversing this won't be too big of a problem. I'm using this video camera just as a matter of convenience. Using film out here would prove to be logistically too difficult. Uh, hopefully we can get you some good footage and really try to demonstrate the uh, intrepid nature of Stephen and Logan. From the memory of Eden Store to the dust lying on your I feel with some more work that I will find the killer. I will see the face of the killer. All the pines in the forest came to hear the screams of the shepherd's name. All the sheep in your flock remain. Tied in stables, tied in stables. Bless you, mother, in your divine hand. In the castles you have built with sand. From the memory of Eden Store to the dust lying on your This 
site is a very close approximation of the one used by Stephen and Locus on the night of the Jersey Devil episode. They'd chosen a clearing similar to this one as base camp for the telecast. When they ventured onto the Pine Barrens with their cameras, they would never return alive again. The documentary footage that they generated on that evening proves irrevocably that Jim Seward was not responsible for their murders. That Locus and Ryan Clacken were actually alive at the time they were ostensibly killed and that the police case was shoddy at best. What is the Jersey Devil? It's a man wandering into the Pine Barrens never to be seen again. It's a mangled animal found on one of these access roads. Or perhaps it's something that rests within our psyche and we'll never truly understand. I've been on this project for months now and haven't come to a clear definition of what actually happened or who was responsible. All I know is that it's a mystery and it may permanently remain so. What is the Jersey Devil? I'm now outside of Shelley's studio. All the media, all the interviews, the truth comes down to this one frame. I've determined that this is no time to be distracted or set aside in the course of the events that I've uh, set into motion. My next step will be going to the Pine Barrens for a reenactment of the murders of Stephen Avcast, Locust Wheeler, and Ryan Clacken. I am as strong in my resolve as before in, in proving that Jim Seward was not responsible for these murders, that he had neither the intellect nor the logical capacity to carry them through. I think that the replayment of our events here will be quite compelling in the demonstration of Seward's innocence.
This site is a close approximation of the one chosen by Stephen Locus as the site of their fact and fiction Jersey Devil broadcast. They... This site is a close approximation of the one chosen by Stephen and Locus as the site of their fact and fiction Jersey Devil broadcast. They'd chosen a clearing similar to this one as base camp and then ventured into the Pine Barren with their camera. This site is a close approximation of the one chosen by Stephen and Locus as the site of their fact and fiction Jersey Devil broadcast. This site They'd chosen a clearing similar to this one as base camp and then ventured into the Pine Barren with their camera. Yes, this site is a close approximation of the one chosen by Stephen and Locus as the site of their fact and fiction Jersey Devil broadcast. They'd chosen a clearing very similar to this one as base camp. And ventured they, out into the pine barrens with their cameras to try and capture the Jersey base Devil. This site is a close approximation of the one chosen by Steve. The documentary footage that they generated that evening proves irrevocably that Jim Seward had nothing to do with it.